Thank you. All right. More on salt. Um, although I teach at a law school, I'm not a trial lawyer. Start with that. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so thanks for the opportunity to be here at this beautiful venue on this uh, little bit of a rainy afternoon. Uh, I'm Dave Stripling. I teach at Marquette Law School um, and I direct our Water Law and Policy Initiative. I want to thank at the outset the Southeastern Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission for uh, supporting the work that I'm going to tell you about today. Um, this was a report that we did as part of a broader study that Sewer Pack is working on and that you may have heard about. Uh, and I'll just give you the context uh, of our work in the overall study. Um, I've listed the various reports that are being prepared in connection with the broader chloride impact study uh, on this slide. And uh, I'm not going to read them all, but I would characterize most of them as scientific or technical in nature. Ours is the only one that is uh, related to policy uh, having to do with uh, chloride control. And uh, so there are lots of um, great information that's being developed about chloride concentrations in the environment, uh, impacts of chloride on the natural and built environment. Um, mass balance for chloride in southeastern Wisconsin, and a lot of this you heard about in the last uh, excellent presentation uh, as well. So I'm not going to focus on that. Uh, the bulk of my presentation will have to do with uh, policy strategies for uh, chloride control. Okay, so uh, the purpose and overview of the report was to examine a menu of legal and policy options to control uh, chloride pollution of surface water and groundwater. So we're not endorsing any one of the strategies that I'm going to talk about as superior in all contexts or uh, the best in every situation. Uh, we're just providing a menu of options for uh, policymakers, understanding that different ones will be appropriate in different circumstances. Um, now, to, I said I'm going to co concentrate mostly on the legal analysis, and I will. Uh, this technical report does contain a bit of information about uh, sources of chloride to the environment and the risk to human health and natural resources. I won't uh, speak too much to that today because I know you just heard all about that. Uh, but we wanted to have a little bit in the report just to inform the legal analysis um, in the event that someone just picks up the report uh, and reads it on a standalone basis without reading the other reports in the broader uh, chloride impact study. Um, so again, we're generally deferring to the other uh, sewer pack reports that were prepared on chloride uh, impacts to the natural and built environments, uh, chloride concentrations and trends in southeastern Wisconsin and the mass balance uh, analysis. Um, really great work that's being done by sewer pack in those reports. Uh, we're not intending to duplicate that in our work. Um, again, this is just a slightly different presentation to inform uh, the legal analysis. So uh, what are the sources of chloride uh, that we looked at? You've heard about all of them. I think uh, public and private uh, snow and ice removal is the first one that we looked at. Um, highly important, of course, from a public safety perspective uh, in response to the question someone asked during the last presentation, uh, we are not advocating zero salt use on roads. We're advocating optimization. I agree with Allison that uh, advocating zero salt use is a non-starter uh, in this political environment. W wouldn't even uh, be part of the conversation if that's uh, where we where we went. Uh, but the the number one um, concern or uh, driver of over application of salt that we uh, found was contractor concerns about liability, about slip and fall. Uh, in every survey that I've seen, uh, that's the number one reason that contractors overapply salt, especially uh, private contractors who are um, doing the application at your big box stores, your private parking lots, uh, those kinds of settings. Uh, that's the number one concern that they have. And so uh, to really get at the root of this problem, we've got to address that concern. That's just the reality of the situation and we'll talk about a couple of uh, different ways to do that. Uh, there are also other sources that we looked at, uh, water softeners, agricultural uses, uh, wastewater treatment facilities, uh, food processing, uh, and some other industrial sources that are more rare in Wisconsin like uh, oil and gas uh, industries, steel production, and uh, tanning, which 
uh, used to be bigger in Wisconsin than it is now. So uh, the first chapter of our report goes through all of those sources, uh, again, uh, just as a way of setting up the legal analysis. Um, so let me get to the bulk of the report, uh, which is uh, chapter two of technical report 67. Um, as I said, there's been a lot of great work done that has demonstrated the harm uh, that chloride can do to human health and the uh, environment. Uh, where I think our work fills a little bit of a gap uh, is that very little of that work has gone towards uh, policy strategies or legal uh, devices to uh, control chloride uh, application. And part of that is due to the public safety concerns, uh, public, part of it is due to public perceptions, part of it is due to inaccurate weather forecasts, uh, the affordability and effectiveness of salt I think plays into it, uh, but again, this concern about legal liability is certainly a big driver uh, as well that uh, we want to be cognizant of and address. Um, so for all those reasons, I think overuse of salt has long been perceived as the safe strategy. Uh, and you know there are good reasons for that when it comes to liability control or uh, even uh, what we call salt extra contracts, which are which means the contractor gets paid. Uh, in part based on how much salt they put down. Um, I think that may be changing though. Uh, and part of it is efforts in the courts uh, by citizens and environmental groups um, to target uh, municipalities and private property owners for over application of salt uh, and the re resulting harm. So in the report, we talk about a few of those efforts, uh, lawsuits in other states, uh, some that have been successful and some that uh, have not. I've uh, detailed one on the slide here that uh, had to do with citizens suing GM, uh, General Motors, near its uh, Milford Proving Grounds in uh, Brighton, Michigan. Uh, you can imagine how much salt uh, is used to keep a automobile test track uh, cleared in Michigan. It's a lot. Uh, hundreds of thousands of tons applied over decades, uh, and GM paid up on that suit and settled uh, out of court. So. Um, these suits aren't often successful, I would say, but um, I would expect to see more of these claims uh, as uh, time goes by, uh, and maybe that helps balance uh, the pendulum uh, a little bit uh, in the legal sense. Okay, so here are the uh, policy options that we uh, reviewed. Uh, we looked at them from a variety of uh, standpoints and metrics, uh, from uh, environmental effectiveness, cost, implementability, uh, all those kinds of things. And so I'll just talk a little bit about each one of them uh, for the rest of the presentation. Uh, but this gives you a sense of the, the scope of what we looked at, everything from uh, limiting liability, the, the bill that uh, Allison talked about and Hannah in the last uh, presentation, uh, informational strategies like SaltWise, uh, direct regulatory strategies under the Clean Water Act or uh, even municipal ordinances, uh, chloride alternatives uh, like green infrastructure or uh, beet juice and cheese brine, uh, all those kinds of uh, radical solutions. Uh, Wisconsin's new water quality trading program, which has primarily been used for phosphorus uh, control, but we think could also uh, have some potential for chloride control. Uh, integrated watershed management, really a buzzword, um, I think, in uh, water resources right now, but one that uh, doesn't have a whole lot of um, concreteness, I think, to me, and uh, needs to be fleshed out in terms of exactly what it entails. Uh, and finally, economic measures and assistance. You know, could we get any help through uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law, the uh, clean water revolving fund, the drinking water revolving fund, uh, those kinds of uh, questions. So let me talk a little bit more uh, about each one of these. Uh, limiting liability. Okay, so again, I think this is the primary driver uh, in many cases of over application of salt, uh, especially on private property. Uh, the fear uh, that someone is going to be injured and sue uh, both the contractor and the property owner uh, for damages. And uh, really the, the leader uh, in addressing that has been the state of New Hampshire, uh, which, uh, as I say here, provides a snow and ice related liability waiver uh, to certified parties after training on best practices. So uh, you go through a program, you get certified by the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, uh, and then absent gross negligence or reckless uh, behavior, um, you cannot be sued uh, for a slip and fall claim, uh, and neither can the owner uh, of the property that you have uh, treated. So 
it's revolutionary. I mean, I don't know that there's really any other way to say it, and you can see why the trial lawyers uh, oppose that kind of uh, bill. Um, but um, it's it, it really goes a long way towards addressing this slip and fall um, concern. And I think uh, there are a lot of advantages that we looked at uh, in the report and describe. It's efficiency forcing in terms of the amount of salt that's applied, uh, but it also brings in environmental uh, concerns and, and public health and uh, liability concerns as well. So there's a, a cost reduction uh, due to the decreased salt usage, and uh, obviously that's a, an undercounting of the total dollars that we're saving for the reasons that uh, Allison and Hannah described in the last presentation uh, in terms of the, the uh, you know, decreased impacts on human health and the environment. Um, there are potential insurance benefits. We've seen uh, insurers in New Hampshire telling their clients to get certified under this uh, program and using it as a, a shield against these kinds of cases. And so uh, in, in some uh, events, they're even providing a break uh, on the insurance rates to certified uh, contractors. So there's a benefit along those lines uh, as well. You can also market yourself uh, as a certified Green Snow Pro contractor. I've got the logo uh, up on the screen there. So there may be advantages along those lines uh, as well. That said, uh, there are some significant challenges uh, that come with a program like this as well. Uh, the first one is getting it enacted. Um, it's been uh, really hard uh, in Wisconsin, as uh, Allison described, to get this bill uh, to the point that it is. In New Hampshire, it took four, uh, four tries, uh, and it eventually, I, I think it's fair to say, slipped through uh, as part of a budget uh, bill, an amendment to a budget bill. Um, so not easy uh, to get legislation like this uh, put in place. Uh, it is voluntary. Uh, the department has found, I think, in New Hampshire, the Department of Environmental Services uh, has found that it's difficult to maintain funding uh, for the program, that the legislature isn't uh, always allocating money uh, for it. Um, there are also some additional obligations placed on contractors. They have to keep records. Uh, they have to report uh, periodically the amount of salt that they use. They have to be recertified uh, every year. And uh, to me, as a lawyer, uh, those seem like pretty minor uh, obligations in exchange for uh, the liability waiver, but there have been uh, some complaints uh, about that in New Hampshire. Um, there have been some legal challenges uh, to the liability waiver in New Hampshire. So far, those have been unsuccess unsuccessful. I don't wanna get down too far into the legal weeds, but uh, those have, have been based on things like due process and equal protection. Uh, those have not succeeded, at least in uh, New Hampshire. There are some demonstrable results uh, associated with the program, uh, the New Hampshire program, a decrease uh, uh, shown in uh, average salt use, uh, a decrease in chloride concentrations in impaired watersheds, uh, hundreds of participants certified, um, so really it's doing some positive things, I think, um, and there have been some efforts to uh, replicate it elsewhere, um, most prominently here in Wisconsin. Um, and you heard some uh, news on that in the uh, last presentation, so I won't belabor the point, but uh, the program here would be very similar to the New Hampshire program that I've uh, just been describing. Uh, it was passed by both the uh, Wisconsin Senate and Assembly, both houses, uh, of our legislature, and it's awaiting, a, I, I say signature, uh, optimistically, on the uh, slide here by Governor Evers. Uh, more, maybe more uh, accurate to say it's awaiting a decision uh, by Governor Evers on whether to sign it or not. But um, towards the end of the process, uh, a lot of the Democrats did withdraw their names as co-sponsors uh, of the bill uh, and, and withdrew their support of it as well. So I think it is quite questionable whether uh, Governor Evers will sign it or not. Okay, uh, so that's that's one strategy that we looked at. I also want to um, talk about direct uh, regulatory strategies that agencies like uh, the DNR uh, could pursue, or possibly the DOT. Um, these might include uh, permits issued to the Clean Water Act, uh, mandated or incentivized best management practices, or even uh, municipal ordinances. The city of Madison has a new one that I'll talk briefly about. So 
um, we do have water quality standards for uh, chloride uh, issued under the Clean Water Act. Uh, there is some a question about whether they are protective enough, I would say. Um, and so uh, whether or not that's true, uh, DNR can enact TMDLs, total maximum daily loads for uh, chloride in Wisconsin waters. And indeed, there are some uh, of our waters that are impaired for chloride or have been put on uh, what's called the 303D list, the impaired waters list uh, in Wisconsin. And so uh, DNR is supposed to develop in those cases um, a budget, a pollution budget for those waters uh, and allocate uh, slices of that pie to both point and non-point chloride dischargers uh, to those waters. It's a long process, not easy to enforce, uh, but this would be uh, one avenue for uh, chloride regulation under the directly under the Clean Water Act. Um, you put those discharge limits directly into the permits that are issued to point sources, tougher uh, with respect to the non-point sources, uh, but you can give them limits uh, as well. Um, you could also uh, regulate uh, salt application, which uh, was rare uh, in our survey of the states. Not many states uh, have direct regulation of uh, application rates. Um, salt storage is more common. In Wisconsin, we do regulate uh, salt storage facilities. It has to have a roof and walls, uh, those kinds of things. They're not supposed to be open piles. Um, you could put reporting re requirements in place, um, or you could have guidance. Uh, the problem with guidance is it's often not mandatory, uh, of course, uh, and it varies widely uh, between states. I've just uh, put a few um, examples on the board here. So, you know, in terms of uh, de-icing application guidance at uh, identical weather conditions, 24 degrees uh, and light snow, uh, you can see that Minnesota recommends 80 to 120 pounds per lane mile, New Hampshire 250 pounds per lane mile, uh, and Wisconsin 100 to 300 pounds uh, per lane mile. Again, these are at the same weather conditions, same data point. Uh, the states uh, diverge broadly uh, in terms of how much salt they um, recommend applying. So this seems to be a good place where uh, the federal DOT might come in and uh, offer some recommendations or guidance as to what the appropriate uh, application rate would be, uh, but there doesn't seem to be any um, a desire to do that on, on behalf of the, the feds. Um, Water softeners, uh, another thing that we looked at as part of our analysis, uh, you could regulate uh, the use of water softeners. You could, uh, for example, ban them, uh, as has been done in some cities in California. I don't foresee that uh, extreme of a measure happening here, but you could also uh, require higher efficiency softening or uh, on-demand softening as opposed to timed softening, where the water softener just runs automatically at you know, two in the morning every day or uh, what have you. So you could regulate that in new construction, uh, require that, for example, the, uh, the building code would require that um, if you're going to install a water softener, it has to meet uh, certain requirements. That would be uh, a possibility. Um, there, was a, a, there were a couple of questions uh, after the last presentation, which I would uh, put under the category of level of service uh, questions or um, things that you could address in a salt management plan, things like route optimization, uh, where some areas receive more salt than others, hills, uh, intersections, uh, heavily traveled roads, as compared to uh, neighborhood streets. Uh, my neighborhood isn't salted at all, uh, except at the intersections and uh, at hilly points. Um, so targeted use rather than you know just spreading it everywhere, uh, no matter the uh, storm. Uh, use of alternate alternative de-icers, I'll talk about that more uh, a little bit later. Uh, road and weather information systems, Wisconsin has this, uh, that all municipalities have access to it and, and the counties, um, sort of predictive measures for how much salt you might need uh, to apply after a given storm. Uh, and of course, anti-icing or pre-treatment methods as opposed to just uh, putting down rock salt. Um, said I'd uh, mention uh, Madison's ordinance, um, this is pretty new. Uh, property owners are limited to the use of reasonable quantities of salt uh, only to the extent necessary to allow safe travel. Uh, the timing is restricted only to uh, when ice is present or imminently likely to form. Uh, and this is a, a something different. It has to be removed uh, promptly following the storm or following the melting of the ice. Uh, you don't see that uh, very often. I think the um, 
ordinance is mainly intended to be educational. Uh, there aren't large penalties uh, at stake here. Um, so it's not um, supposed to be very punitive. Uh, it's just supposed to be, you know, we'll give you a warning uh, on this one. You're supposed to um, remove the salt after it's served its purpose. Um, informational strategies. So these are things like SaltWise, uh, which you heard a lot about uh, earlier today, and uh, I won't uh, talk too much about it. Um, this is a common um, strategy in environmental law. If you've heard of NEPA, the National Environmental uh, Policy Act, this is exactly the strategy that's uh, incorporated there. We just want to uh, study uh, or learn about or uh, pass along information about uh, the decisions that we're going to uh, make. So we want to encourage uh, optimal use of chlorides. Again, I, I'm not suggesting zero use here. I don't think that's uh, possible in the current um, environment, but you want to show the public and policymakers, hey, we have this data. Uh, we've got decades of data uh, showing how much we're overusing cl uh, chloride and the impact that it's having on our uh, waters and our wells and our environment. Um, you know, we need to respond to this in, in, some, in some way. And so we're trying to educate both uh, the public uh, and chloride users uh, when it comes to those uh, questions. Uh, chloride alternatives, that was another one of the green boxes that I had, uh, one of the strategies that uh, we looked at from a legal or policy uh, perspective. And uh, probably the most prominent thing that we looked at here was green infrastructure, um, which means a lot of different things uh, to different people. But the one that we looked at the most was permeable pavements. Uh, so the thinking here is if you allow uh, moisture, snow, rain, whatever, um, to percolate through the pavement um, without forming ice on the surface in the first place, um, you're going to reduce the amount of salt uh, that you need on those uh, pavements. Um, so there's a significant cost savings to that. There's a significant reduction in pollutant loads and, and runoff um, and road salt application. Uh, but of course, this is only going to be effective to the extent it reduces the need to apply chloride in the first place. Uh, as many folks have pointed out to me, uh, if it just if the chloride just percolates down uh, through the pavement with the rain and the and the snow melting snow, it's just going to transit to a uh, groundwater. So we're not uh, saving ourselves anything uh, at all unless we can actually reduce uh, the chloride application rate to the surface uh, in the first place. Now. Uh, there's evidence on both sides of this. Uh, there have been studies in New Hampshire, again, apparently a big leader uh, in this area, that um, permeable pavement reduces salt application requirements by 75%, again, because you don't get that ponding uh, of water on the surface. On the other hand, we've talked with a number of municipalities uh, here in Wisconsin, and they say, no, that doesn't work. Uh, we still end up salting that permeable pavement uh, almost at the same levels as we uh, salt our regular pavement. So. I'm not ready to draw any conclusions as I stand here today about uh, whether permeable pavement uh, is an effective strategy or not. Again, there are different um, pieces of evidence on both sides of that uh, question. And of course, there are lots of other uh, reasons that green infrastructure hasn't been as widely adopted as maybe it, it should have been. Uh, cost, public resistance, uh, lack of knowledge, um, all those kinds of uh, things. Maintenance, operation and maintenance costs. Um, other alternative deicers, de we did look at, you know, the beet juices and the cheese brines and things like that, uh, as Allison said, and I completely agree, uh, those come in many cases with their own uh, environmental impacts. Um, increased biochemical oxygen demand, um, toxicity, mercury, um, depending on what it is that you're talking about, um, those have their own environmental effects. So it's really a risk versus risk uh, analysis. What are you uh, more concerned about? And um, so they're not often used, uh, is what we found. Uh, water quality trading. I think it's worth uh, looking into this uh, a little bit as well. Um, a market-based approach to uh, reduce pollutant transport to waters. Again, this program was really designed uh, to handle phosphorus uh, concerns, but we think it might uh, have some possibility to affect uh, chloride as well. So typically what happens here is uh, there's a point source uh, which is subject to significant compliance costs under the Clean Water Act uh, for phosphorus, let's say. It sees that there is a non-point source uh, not subject to those same compliance costs, um, and the point source then pays the non-point source to reduce its discharge to the same watershed, um, and the uh, permitting agency allows that as a method of meeting the point source's permit. 
Um, so could that be used um, for chloride? Um, there is a program for this in uh, Wisconsin. DNR has published um, a guidance packet that's well over 100 pages long uh, that uh, I recommend to you if you're interested in this uh, subject. Um, but um, to get right to the point, uh, again, this has largely been used to facilitate trades related to phosphorus. I think the uh, trading partners would look a little uh, different uh, for trades involving chloride. Maybe they could happen between uh, wastewater treatment facilities and MS4s, uh, for instance, um, and might generate lower transaction costs because uh, in this sphere, everybody knows uh, everybody else, I think, and it'd be easier to find uh, trading partners as opposed to if you're looking for phosphorus reductions, you got to go talk to individual farmers, uh, that type of thing. Um, integrated watershed management. Um, the one water approach, uh, I said earlier uh, that to me, the precise scope and content of this uh, remains unclear. It's sort of on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. It could mean information sharing. It could mean planning. Uh, at the end of the spectrum, it could mean shared management. Um, if one entity is willing to give up uh, a little bit of authority, um, the, the plus here is that it promotes coordinated development uh, and management of water resources. Ideally, you have multiple agencies, multiple jurisdictions uh, working together to address some of these uh, concerns, uh, but uh, it's vague. Uh, there are funding difficulties. Uh, there are inertial uh, impediments to this, legal roadblocks in some cases when one jurisdiction feels, hey, I'm required to do this by Wisconsin law uh, that manage this resource. I'm not able to share any uh, authority over it. Um, so it's not easy to uh, put it in place. Um, when it comes to chloride reduction, I don't know that uh, there will be a lot of examples of integrated watershed management solely for chloride. Uh, but what I would say is when you've got an inter shed, in, inter, um, integrated watershed management framework, um, that should include some consideration of chloride as well, uh, at least. Um, so there's one uh, example of this out there, and that's the CAUSE system, the Chicago Area Waterway. Uh, system. As uh, Hannah said, there's a 500 milligram per liter water quality standard in Illinois. Uh, and so Metro uh, Water of Greater Chicago has organized this group um, to try to develop a minimization plan uh, applicable to that uh, particular watershed. Uh, last thing I'll talk about, and uh, then I, I'm just about out of time here, is uh, economic measures and assistance. Uh, at its basic level, this is just you know supply and demand. Uh, driving uh, use rates of salt in some cases. There have been some winters uh, in which a lot of salt application has been required. The cost has gone way up. Uh, and what we've, seen, what we've seen in those cases is less application per storm uh, because uh, municipalities, counties uh, can't afford it. Um, so that's sort of the basic level. Um, but there could be uh, other potential sources of money out there to uh, upgrade trucks, uh, pay for salt uh, minimization plans, uh, all those kinds of things. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law is one of them. Uh, potentially some components of the road and bridge projects or the clean drinking water projects uh, that could reduce chloride. Uh, there's also the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, of course, which is uh, intended to restore and maintain the Great Lakes ecosystem. You could envision perhaps um, some projects that would be funded uh, under that. Uh, mentioned the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act revolving funds. Both of those have funded uh, some chloride reduction projects in the past. Uh, WISDOT provides funding in some cases for converting trucks uh, from uh, coarse salting to uh, brining and pre-wetting uh, operations. Um, so those are all possibilities under that last uh, thing that we looked at. So again, not all of these will be appropriate uh, in every given context. Policymakers might uh, choose one or more. Uh, but I do think that uh, there's some triple bottom line benefits uh, that could be realized here, both uh, to the uh, environment, the economy, uh, and to society. So I encourage you to read the report um, at the Sewer Pack website if you're interested in this, and not just my report, but all of the great chloride work uh, that has been done. I've got my uh, contact info and email on the screen here. Happy to uh, talk more about this with anyone who's interested and I don't know, do we have any time for questions or do we need to get to the break? Okay, I'll hang out during the break. Uh, feel free to uh, ask questions, come on up and say hello. Thank you. All right, thank you. We're gonna take a